and maybe a couple applications from our passage this morning that we're continuing to study. Um, and then we are going to take a break for at least one week uh, because next week will be our quarterly meeting. Uh, today's the third, right? So next week's the 10th. So our quarterly meeting is next week. Um, and on, our, on the days that we do our quarterly meetings, uh, we do, a, instead of a study at 10 a.m., we do a fasting and prayer. So you guys will get an email explaining that this week again. Is, uh, you know, if you've been here for at least a quarter, you know that we'll, we'll do that on, uh, on these quarterly meeting days. Um, we'll break the fast together, if you are, in fact, joining us in that, uh, after church with uh, lunch being provided by the woman who just seems to also do everything here, Stacy. Uh, she's going to make sure we get lunch cared for on that day uh, next week. And if you do need help and, and you'd like to help her with that in any way, uh, see her after church. Um, so, uh, just so keep in mind, next week, no study, fasting and prayer during this time period. Um, and make sure to please join us to at least pray. Um, and if physically you're able to fast, uh, we would encourage you to do that as well. Um, so our, we've gone through observation, interpretation, and application, and we've been applying those to the passage of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And our goal together has been just to feel out this, this strategy for studying uh, as a group so that we're sort of getting the hang of it and, and at least getting some some working introduction to how this, this, uh, these, this method works. Um, have you guys, you guys learned anything from this class at all? <laughs> you, you guys have taken, is there been anything in the class that uh, in your own study at home or your own reading, you're like, oh, I remember that from class and who's Peter? Yeah, <laughs> who's Peter? Anybody? Okay, well, in two weeks, we'll start over. We'll go do the class again, right? <laughs> Pray. Yeah. Have you been praying before reading that? Yeah. What? If, I'll, if you don't do anything else, do that. That's, that's my philosophy. If you don't do anything else, pray. So uh, we're going to get into the interpretation um, portion of our study here, and we're going to try and understand this passage. And when we do interpretation... The question that we're asking is what? What does it mean, right? So we want to ask the question, what does it mean? Um, let's go ahead and we'll read the text. I'll pray, and then we'll dive in with some, this will be my guiding us through interpretation, okay? Peter says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Once you've tasted that the Lord is good, let's pray. Father, we would be in the dark were it not for your word to us, which is light. We would be unaware of who you are and all that you have done and all that you plan to do were it not for you speaking to us through the prophets and the apostles. And here today, Father, we are gathered together to study the words that you have spoken, words that are timeless and never become outdated. Words, Father, that, uh, Lord, ring true today in our lives as much as they did in the lives of those who first heard. We pray, Father, that your spirit would give us wisdom, that he would lead us into all understanding, that this would be a fruitful endeavor this morning, and that having been together as the body of Christ, and most importantly, feasting uh, at your word, uh, God, that we would walk away strengthened, encouraged, uh, with a stronger spiritual resolve for Christ and righteousness in our life, and Lord, uh, a better handling of your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, so we want to ask, what does it mean? Now, we saw last week, just by way of sort of bridging from observation to interpretation. You see all right? Yeah? Yeah. So we have, you, you memorized it all already. Okay, so we have this, this formula here that we, that we did last week, right? So we noticed that <clears throat> if we were to put things in, say, like an order it, from the text, we saw that, first of all, there was belief. Remember, because he says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. He's referring to the fact that they believed, okay, that they have come to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They put their faith in Jesus Christ. This is something that was already done. Now that you have already done this, let's go forward doing this. Now, that, that uh, statement right there is strengthened by the verses that, were, that came before chapter 2. And, and if you look in chapter, at the end of chapter 1 in 1 Peter, he says this to his audience. He says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have a sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word. When he says you've been born again through the word of God, what did they do in response to the word of God that they would be born by it? They believed. That's right, they believed. So they believed they were saved. Now he's saying, in this chapter, in our verses here, he's telling them to, to do two things. And we saw last week that they need to rid themselves of sinful attitudes and behaviors, and they needed to crave the Word of God. They needed to, they needed to devote themselves, heart and soul, to the Word of God. Okay? So you have believed, and then they rid themselves, and they crave for the Word of God, and then that is going to result in what? Growth. Okay, so growth. All of that is... All of that is, is, is adding up to their spiritual growth. So that is, uh, that is a major theme in this text, is growth and the means by which they, they do it, okay? So let's look at what does the immediate context tell us? What does the immediate context tell us? So we're going to pick back up on the before and the after, okay? So before our passage we had the end of chapter 1. And in the end of chapter 1, we had observed that Paul, or excuse me, Peter told the believers to do what with each other? Love each other. And how does he say it, actually? What, what, does he just say love each other? What, specifically, what's he say? Fervently, from a pure heart. Yeah. Okay, so he wants, he doesn't want shallow love. He wants true, genuine. It, it, if I were preaching on this text, I would definitely reference Philippians chapter 1 when Paul says, I have the bowels of Christ for you. Like, I have the deep affection that Christ has for you. I have that for you as well. You know? He says, so I be devoted sincerely and fervently from the heart to one another. Okay? And then he says, he says what? What? what uh, he talks about the word. Okay? He talks about the word there as we, we, we already mentioned. All right? So he says, you've been born again by the word, love each other, right? So love each other. And then we have afterwards, in the next passage, after our passage, verses 4 and 5, if you'll read that, look there with me. Let me read it. He says, as you come to Christ, the living stone, which was rejected by men, but chosen by God and um, precious to God, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, so the believers, we believers, are being built into what? A spiritual house, okay? There's, there's, a, there's a constant construction in the church that is happening. Who's building the church? Jesus Christ. Right? So that's constantly happening. There's, there's a, he goes into and he's talking about being built into a spiritual house, which requires what here? Unity. Unity. Now there is a fact of unity that all of us believers have, isn't there? Like when, when, when by virtue simply of believing in Jesus Christ, we are united in Christ. 
What's one thing that each of us possesses inside of his or herself that all of us possess? The Holy Spirit. There's a unity there that transcends any other unity. Okay? There's a unity there that transcends any other unity. So we are united. You, can you change that? Can you say, hey, I'm all done with the Holy Spirit. I don't like Al. I don't want to be united to that guy. I'm... If, <laughs> if you're Arminian. <laughs> if you're Arminian. So if you're Arminian, you can do that. But if you're not, then you can't do that. But you can't, you can up and leave a church. You can up and leave a church, but you can't leave that unity, that spiritual unity that just is because you have the spirit of God inside of you. Okay. Now, so there's unity there, but then he's talking about, there's another kind of unity in the church that is crucial. What kind of unity is that? Like-mindedness? Yeah. Fellowship? I mean, I mean, did the Corinthians have unity? No, I mean, they were united, like we're talking about, because they all were Christians, but, but they didn't have a relational unity with each other. They, they were divided against each other, okay? What's coming again? Okay, you just nailed it. All right, so what Al's doing is he's making, what you guys probably all already see, and you're waiting for me to just say it, is, is this love, okay, has something to do with this unity, because this unity has something to do with being built into a spiritual house that is functioning in a certain way. What did verse 5 say that we were being built into a spiritual house to do? What does it say there? Holy priesthood and doing what? Spiritual sacrifices, and one more thing. At least my NIV has it, I don't know. The 84 NIV. So spiritual sacrifices, what does it say? Built in this, oh, okay, I, I was incorporating a different verse, my bad. You're right, I was wrong. I have no problem admitting I was wrong. Okay. Uh, so unity, relational unity results in our being built into a spiritual house that is doing what it's supposed to be doing, and that is offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ, and those sacrifices are not in any way being impeded by disunity. See that? Unity is crucial. We're utterly impotent as a church if we are divided. This is, again, I'll say this, on Wednesday nights, that's why we pray. A lot of you guys are on Wednesday night prayer meeting. That's why we have every week up there the unity, the love, and the peace characterizing our church fellowship. Because those are absolutely essential for a church to be pleasing to God and to be useful in the hand of God, okay? So we have love. We have to love each other so that we are united relationally in the church. And what we have in the middle of that is what I would say an explanation of how to love each other specifically. So let me ask you a question. Where would you see that there is love in our text for other believers? Yeah. So Al is pointing out, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. That's a loving thing to do. By obeying verse 1, you are increasing and improving the love in the body of Christ. Okay? These things are unloving. Now, if I were preaching this, I would probably say, I would, I would itemize out each one of these, and I would want to define them and then give examples of them. And I might even say, you know, here we have a list and then it's, what would be a fun exercise for you guys to do is to go and look up other lists that Peter and Paul have in their writings. You know, you could go to like Galatians 5, join Kathy Tabor's Bible study on Galatians. You'll get there eventually, right? So Galatians 5 has a list of the acts of the sinful nature. It also has a list of the fruit of the Spirit, right? So you, you see lists all over the place in the Bible. It'd be a fun and edifying study to look at lists. Now... Yeah. So Al's saying, looking up what the original word for rid is, 
It'd be a great study in itself. Just putting aside, throwing aside, getting rid of something, no longer, um, no longer letting it function in your life. Uh, what'd you say? Power washing? <laughs> Power wash the envy and the malice off your... <laughs> okay, good. So what you have is you have, you have rid and you have craved the word and then so that we can grow, right? So love each other so that you can grow and you can continue with this ongoing building up in unity and service to God. Like, like there's, there's a constant growing which leads to a constant improvement in usefulness to God. So here's a question. Is there ever a point in our lives as believers where we can rightly plateau? No. Okay, I jumped ahead to an application, but there you go. When we do applications, you can, you can say that. Okay, so here we go. That's, what, that's our immediate context. Love, grow, unity, and service to God, okay? Next, let's look at the larger context of the book itself. And go back to chapter 1. If you're, if you're there, look at verse 1. And we had identified when we first started this, this verse, um, we had identified some characteristics of the audience that, that, that Peter was addressing, okay? And there's one, in, uh, one specifically that I want to identify in verse 1. So he says, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect. Uh, okay, so what does he start saying about them? What's one thing here? They were chosen. Yep, what else? Scattered. That's the one I'm looking for. Yep. Now they are all those other things. They're scattered. Why might they be scattered? Persecution. Okay. Now, what's a word that starts with S that means the same, that, that people undergo when they're being persecuted? Suffering. Suffering. There you go. Yep. It, if you haven't noticed, like if you're a preacher or a teacher, everything has to alliterate. They teach you that in seminary, don't they, Ray? Like it's a class all in itself. Your only textbook is a thesaurus. Okay? So scattered, they're suffering. Look at verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Look at chapter 2. Verse 19, for it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So we see again, his believers were facing, his readers were facing suffering. Go to chapter 3. Every single chapter, he is pointing out to them, he is acknowledging that they are undergoing suffering for their faith, and he is giving them perspective and instruction regarding it. So chapter 3, verse 14, he says, uh, But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So here again, we have more perspective on suffering. The context of these believers is that they are suffering. The first five verses of chapter four, probably the most uh, potent, if you will, uh, of Peter's words on the topic of suffering are in chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. Follow along with me in verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory in God rests on you. 
If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Okay, and he goes on all the way down to verse 19, still talking about these things. What is the context, right, that these believers are in when they receive um, the letter from Peter? They are scattered and they are suffering. Okay, here's my question. Well, two. First one is what types of suffering were they facing? Just as we read some of those. Um, verses. What kinds of things do we see that they were facing? Economic, right? So there's economic. Were people getting rich being Christians? Okay. Economic. So job loss, right? Job loss, no customers. Right on down the line. Okay. Economic. Um, what else do you see? Physical? Yeah, because he says if you receive a what for doing good, it's commendable in God's eyes. Starts with a B. Beating, yeah. I have not been beat yet for my faith. Um, fear, yeah. So there's a... Uh, Fear is emotional suffering. The fear and the anxiety and the worry that go along with that. Anything else? What's that? Yeah. Reviled. So this would, this would be like social type of suffering where people around you Friends, family, neighbors, co-workers are going to lie about you, slander you, right? Because chapter 3, he says, if people slander you, let you do, be devoted to good deeds so that they'll eventually be ashamed of their slander, right? Reviled, slander, um, lie about, okay? If you're treated unfairly, what's your tip? What's your, whoosh, right? Yeah, you're ready, to, you're ready to go to war. People may be reviling you, lying about you, slandering your reputation and your name, taking your, uh, firing you from your job, all this stuff, okay? And, and what, what is it inside of you that would, how would you want to react, right? So, to your point is there's that, I don't, I don't even know how to begin writing that. Pride, sin nature, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, um, so it's, it's gonna bring out your sin nature. Marker board, sin nature. So uh, there's other things, uh, you could be imprisoned. Hebrews chapter 13 talks about those who are imprisoned, okay? So you could be imprisoned for your faith, um, and what's the last one, the, the big one? The going home one. Yeah, death. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs, for instance, and you, you, you see the legend of all the, the, the deaths of the apostles, and then you look at Timothy's, and there was like a, essentially a, an early version of a gay pride going on in his city, and he went out and, for, and he was rebuking them at the pride and at, at the festival, and they beat him with clubs, and he took two days and he finally died. This is Timothy in the Bible. Um, Timothy, Timothy, first and second Timothy. So, suffered and died for his faith. Not hiding, but out on the sidewalk as they're going by, preaching the gospel to him and trying to get them to repent and turn. And they say Timothy was timid. Well, he must have got over that because <laughs> he must have got over that. Uh, so here's, here, if, this, if they're facing this kind of stuff, what would they be tempted to think and to do as uh, believers who are, who are scattered and suffering in these ways? What, what, what are some ways that they may have uh, responded to, uh, it, what were the temptations to hide, right? Okay, so to hide or, uh, and, and they would hide because of what? 
they're scared, and they'd be scared to stand for Christ, right? So they'd be scared, they'd hide, and they, whether they hide or not, the thing is, is would they deny Christ under the pressure? You know, that's the thing. So, so, so they wouldn't want to stand for Christ, right? Like, so Paul's, or Peter's trying to, like, strengthen their resolve. Hey, don't, you notice how he begins in chapter one. He's like, your faith shields you, you know, in this present suffering you're going through. He says, but your reward that's coming. He's like, he's saying, the value of your faith and standing with Christ and what is going to come as a result of you standing through, the, through persecution, he says, so far outweighs anything you're going through right now. You read chapter one and get, get that from that. Um, so they would be, uh, so they would be, they would want to hide or they might want to be like Demas. Do you guys remember Demas in 2 Timothy chapter, I think it's 4? He, he was one of Paul's most devoted workers, and he said, uh, Paul said that he, he abandoned the ministry because, and he went back to Thessalonica because he loved the world. Right? So the, the, temptation, um, the temptation in the face of suffering would be to just walk away. Walk away. And what would be some things? Is it comfortable to suffer persecution? And to undergo things, all right? So walk away for comfort or advantage, right? Or, what's that? Family. You read Tortured for Christ. Remember we had all those books out there, Tortured for Christ? We are giving away. You read through that, and a lot of the guys who who were arrested by these um, communists in Romania and thrown into prison, their families were, um, were pariah. Like you were, the, the community was not allowed to help the, the mom, the wife, and the, the, the children. And so they were literally left stranded trying to fend for themselves. And you had great incentive, if you were a believer, if you were the head of the household, to shut up for the sake of your family. A lot of these guys didn't. And one of the things that uh, Wormbrandt says in his book is he says one of the most overlooked and most important ministries is, being, is materially helping those, those wives and those children in those countries around the world, even to this day, because the breadwinner is imprisoned, and then they can't even like, go get jobs. They're economically persecuted, okay? So huge way to help uh, the suffering church around the world. So for family, um, safety, we'll say. It certainly is safe, you know, to not stand with Christ, at least for now, at least in this world. Um, freedom, right? Because if you can be arrested, you know, there's probably freedom. Is, is comfort, advantage, family, safety, and freedom, are those the... Are those, the, are those important things? Are they the most important thing for us in this life? Maybe some of these things will be put to the test in us, like they were for our ancient brothers and sisters. Um, what might they have thought about God? What would have been some temptation, some, some tempting thoughts? God abandoned us. Like, God, are you... Yeah. Are you real? We're not saying that the, the, the audience thought these things, but as we put ourselves in their shoes, the question is, what would have been the temptations, okay? Okay, had God abandoned them? Can't do anything about it? Yeah. Can't. God stop this? So a question of his power. God abandoning them, that would go to whether or not he cares, right? Um, maybe God knows, do you think they might have struggled with, is he punishing us? Did we do something wrong, right? First of all, did God know what they were going through. Was God there? 
And was he punishing them? Yeah, like first in, I think, first or second Thessalonians. He's like, don't be disturbed by any letters that seem to have come from us, but the day of the Lord has not come yet. Yeah, so like, oh man, did, did everybody else, are they out of here and we're still here? Or, you know, did Jesus come back and he missed us? So, yeah, those are, those are all very tempting things. So these are things, these are things that, are, that they may have felt and they may have, they may have uh, struggled with, now, Peter, go back to chapter 1. We'll read that passage I was telling you about. Let me get my time here. Where are we at on time? Okay, we're good. We're doing good. The biblical authors are always trying to mold the perspective that believers have when those believers are going through persecution. Verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How would that sound to a suffering, persecuted believer? They put Jesus to death, persecuted him all the way to death. God raised him up from the dead. Right? So they remind, he's reminding them already of the very cornerstone of their faith that Jesus is alive from the dead. And that bears down on, on the suffering. What can they do to you that God's ultimately not going to reverse? You know, let me say it even better than that. What, are, what, what can be done to us in this life that ultimately God won't pay back over a hundredfold? What did, what, did he, what did Jesus tell Peter? He's like, uh, well, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? You know, I mean, a legit question. It's a legit question. Jesus says, hey, whoever has given up mother, father, child, son, daughter, right, field, property, business, whatever, lay it all out. He says, will not fail to receive over a hundred times that much at the great renewal of all things. Okay? So praise be, uh, verse 4. So you've been born into a living hope and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. You who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Where was he pointing their attention to? The here and now? He was pointing their attention to the future and what was going to happen in the future that they were looking forward to. The, 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 the glorious, what's that? Eternity? Yep, and, and he, yes. And so he says, uh, he says, looking forward to eternity, not here and now, and not looking down here, but looking looking up. Always we're looking at a diagonal. Up and forward. Up and forward is how we're always looking as believers. These sufferings, verse 7, have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, your faith, that it may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when, what? When Jesus is revealed, right? When Jesus is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Okay? So. Ooh. Ooh. Go for it. Yeah, read it. Yeah. That's a, like you would think, okay, if I suffer to this degree, God in the coming age will reward me to that same degree, just, but he'll reward me to that same. No, it's like saying, this, what you're suffering now, doesn't even compare. What's coming is going to so far outweigh anything that you suffered here in this world. And his what? It, it speaks to him in his terminal illness because he's suffering and yet he knows that his suffering is not for naught and that his suffering will never compare to the glory that he will soon hmm. see. 
yeah. face-to-face. Yeah. See, that's the thing, too. Like, uh, how, do, how do we view, be it persecution or the deterioration of our bodies? Like, this body, it's going in the ground. The one I'm getting next, that's the one I got my eyes on, you know? Put this baby in the ground. Get me out of here and give me what's coming next. Yeah. When, a, when a believer faces death and faces suffering with such hope and dignity, man, there's, there's nothing like... I, I, was, I met a, uh, a woman walking her dog out here this past week, and we were talking. Turns out she's a believer, and uh, her husband is a believer. He's got stage 4 pancreatic cancer. He's had it for like two years. And we were praying on the, on the sidewalk out there, and, but just the way she was, her, she was talking about her and her husband, just the hope. I mean, he's got, they got grandkids like that are my kids' age, you know? I mean, they're in like the prime of life and his days are numbered, but he knows where he's going. He has that, literally, that kind of hope, that, that facing it that way. Um, okay, what was our, real quick, let's say we were to try and pull it all together and you guys give me a sermon, basically right here is what we'll do, is uh, what is the theme that we, of our passage? Spiritual growth. Spiritual growth, that's right. So grow. Right? Spiritual growth. You're on it. Now, if I were to put this into a sermon, I might say things like, okay, because everything in here points towards growth. Remember, and, and when you're trying to find the big idea, the theme, all right, you want something, you want the thing that pulls all of the passage, all the parts of the passage together and gives everything meaning, okay? So what is, what are some things about growth that we have seen in our passage and in our study? Like, what would you said, what would, what would relate to and support growth or what would get in the way of growth? Either or. Change. Okay. In what, in what way? Be specific. All right. So grow by getting rid of sin, right? So I told Annie yesterday, I'm like, I'm like, I so should have made today's sermon on 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And then we do this all in Sunday school, and then I preach on it. <laughs> it would have been so cool to do that, but I'm not that slick, so. Okay, uh, so get rid of sin. What else contributes to growth or we need to be aware of when we want to grow? What's that? God's word. Love, yes. Anything else? Prayer. Yeah. Good. What's that? We will suffer. Could. Do you think God would use the suffering for our growth? Would that preach? Yeah, it would. It'll work too. Like you will, we will. If we, <laughs> if we take P Peter's perspective, we will. So suffering, growing through suffering, you could say. So perseverance, yeah. Was that an E at the end there? I don't even remember how to spell it. Sacrifice, uh, yes. Like. You mean like self-sacrifice, or you mean, you're talking about like the sacrifices that it's talking about in here, like service to God and all of that? Okay, there you are back there. Okay, sacrifice. Yeah. So from our text, from our, from our study, we got the big idea. The big idea is to grow, okay? And in growing, we see that all these things, that the Word of God... Uh, is crucial to our growth. Getting rid of sin is part of growth, okay? Uh, loving each other, okay, is essential to our growth. Uh, prayer, suffering, okay? Persevering through suffering and, and sacrifice. All of those are um, essential to spiritual growth. Ray, I'll give you the last word. Obedience. Don't we have that in here implied anywhere? No? Okay. No one like <laughs> obedience. I gave you the last word, so I'll I'll put it up there. Good, good. So, all right. Well, now we know what to grow. So let's grow.
All right, let's uh, follow the one at the bottom and, and pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy today um, that we have the freedom to be here, uh, to gather and assemble, that we have the freedom, Father, in Christ to worship you, to approach your throne, uh, God, to live for you and to bear the name of Christ in our own lives. God, may we be worthy of our calling and worthy of the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we look at this passage that Peter wrote and we pray, Father, that the things he said, his exhortations, his instructions, would be the things that we obey. God, that we would get rid of all sorts of deceit and hypocrisy and slander and malice and all these things, God, envy. And Lord, that we would take up the righteousness of Christ in our lives and stride forward, uh, Lord, with all that we have within us uh, in service to you that Jesus may be magnified more and more each day from us. And uh, God, we pray that we would at EFC be a spiritual house, that we are being built into such a house, Lord, with greater and greater unity, greater and greater love that is sincere and fervent and, and pure and from our hearts, uh, all for each other and for you, God, that we would love you more and more with each passing day. We pray, Father, that we would be devoted to those spiritual sacrifices that bring you glory and honor, and that, God, in this place, uh, uh, if all else goes dark, that the light may burn bright here. Uh, so, God, we, we praise you this morning, and again, we thank you for what you've given us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.